Welcome back to the Odessa First Assembly Podcast. I'm Tony, the Digital Ministry Manager here at OFA, and we're excited to bring you our new sermon series, Unless the Lord Builds the House. Throughout this series, we'll be exploring what it means to be a healthy church, how we can grow the kingdom of God, and what revival truly looks like in our lives and communities. We'll be diving deep into the Word of God to uncover the principles and practices that will help us build our spiritual homes on a strong foundation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to be challenged and inspired as we embark on this journey of growth and renewal together. Without further ado, here's Pastor Todd Starnes with today's message from Unless the Lord Builds the House. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 1 and Psalm 127. John chapter 1 and Psalm 127. And um, we've had a wonderful time of technology, <laughs> and uh, oh, thankful for Tony and um, Brian. They've been trying to get things sorted out, and uh, we have been having issues with our stream, and I think we are still this morning, and so we think it's um, the, we think it's the... Uh, the internet service provider, and so we're trying to get that worked out and uh, uh, fixed, and so so I say that because uh, my sermon's not coming up, so either we can wing it or <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So yeah, so hopefully we'll get that fixed soon, and um, uh, we'll be able to stream like we have been, and I know it's, uh, it's been frustrating for us. We had projection problems this morning, and it's just uh, sometimes it just seems like, oh, there's our stream right there. Let's rebroadcast that. Okay. So... All right, here we go. Now we're good. 27, unless the Lord builds the house, has been our key verse. We're going to look at it again. So, work of the builders is wasted unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sin. Us, that our hearts be ready, soil. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And don't forget to buy some cookies and stuff, right? So, you guys need that stuff. I was thinking this week, you know, a farmer, I, you know, I, it's probably, I, I wish I was better at growing stuff. This year, my mom's been helping me this last year. And so I've, I've shared with you often, I, I mean, it don't matter. I, I try and try and try, but I, I kill everything I try to grow. You know, eat grass. I mean, I, I can kill weeds. I, it, it's just amazing. And so my mom's been working with me. We actually had some plants on our back porch, and, and they survived and that's like the first time ever. Like, I'm almost 50 years old. That's the first time ever, y'all. Angela's grandfather was a farmer, and I, I, I was really thinking just, you know, what it really takes to get ground ready to plant. And, you know, if, if you go all the way back, I mean, first you got you to gotta clear the field. I mean, you got to clear the stumps. You got to clear the rocks. You got to clear out the brush and the trees, and, and then you got to plow the ground, and and then you plant, and then if you have irrigation, you get to water, or you, you, you know, the farmer comes along and fertilizes or uh, you know, sprays the pesticides that kill bugs and all that stuff. But even after all that is done, here's the saying is what a lot of people say, that there are no atheist farmers. Because a farmer does all that he can do, and then it's still up to the Lord, I mean, there's still so many factors, and so that's what meant by that statement. And so after all that, after all, the farmer does all that he does, there's still the X factor, which is really the God factor. And so that's the same thing as we are looking at this series, as we're looking at our building, as we're looking at our lives, is that unless the Lord builds the house, the builder builds in vain. We do all that we can do, and then the rest is up to the Lord. And so the first thing that I want to remind you of is kind of drawing in from the end of last week is we do what we can do and leave the results up to God. 
We do all that we can do, but what happens after that is to the Lord. What matters to the Lord, but Edward Kimball, is. But Edward Kimball, many of us may have never heard from him, but he was a Sunday school teacher. He was a Sunday school teacher in the 1800s. And he won a, a young man to the Lord. He was a, a shoe salesman in Boston. And this shoe salesman became a well-known evangelist. And that evangelist's name is D.L. Moody. And now maybe a few more of us have heard of D.L. Moody. So Kimball, a Sunday school teacher, wins D.L. Moody to the Lord. And D.L. Moody, he was going, he went to England and was doing some crusades. And there, a man by the name of Frederick Meyer heard his message. And God just really did this work in Brother Meyer. And so he took this back to his Sunday school and, and his church. And, and, and as he began sharing of what God was doing in him, revival began to break out in his church, and people began to confessing sin, and God was doing some amazing things. And so Meyer began, as he was sharing his testimony, and, and this was happening, he was invited to Furman University to preach. And there was a young man there by the name of, Evang- he was uh, R.G. Lee, And God impacted him, so Kimball impacted Moody. Moody, Meyer. Now Meyer, this young man, hears him preach, Lee, and he begins to accept the call to ministry and begins to evangelize. And and so Chapman is preaching, and he influences a man by the name of Billy Sunday. Now some of us know Billy Sunday. Uh, This is going to, just hang with me. And so Billy Sunday and Chapman, they were doing... Um, some meetings, and a man by the name of Mordecai Ham came into their meeting, and so it was the three of these guys doing meetings, and it was in those meetings that Billy Graham got saved. Now, most of us, now, you know, there may be a couple of names, Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, that we recognize, but the, it all began with a man that most of us have never heard of, but yet, through all of those connects, we see a man that we know, uh, yes, he's gone home with the Lord, but I mean, how many has Billy? You see, you ne- all you have to be as faithful and allow God to take care of others and, and influencers and all that kind of stuff. But listen to me. What God can do with us as individuals is more that can happen in any other avenue or way. Billy Graham even said this, Christ not only died for all, but he died for each. He not only died for all, but he died for each. I love that. But the number one thing I think that keeps us from sharing our faith, what I'm talking about this morning, is growing the kingdom of God. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder builds in vain, but the Lord uses us to build the kingdom. And it's a partnership we have with the Lord. But the number one thing about I think that keeps us from sharing our faith is fear. Fear what people think. Fear about what we're going to say. We don't know if we're going to say the right thing. Fear that we're going to say the wrong thing. Fear that our lives don't light up. And I, there's some other reasons why we're not really vocal about our faith. Some may be apathy. Some, you know, there's all kinds of reasons. But I think when it gets down to it, the majority of us want to share our faith. But sometimes we're, we're fearful, we're, we're afraid, and I'm hoping this morning that we can kind of bring a shift to that. And so I want to begin in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35, and we're going to look at Andrew. We're going to look at Andrew, but John chapter 1, verse 35, it says, the following day, John again was standing with the two disciples. This is John the Baptist, as Jesus walked by. Uh, one of my favorite portions of Scripture, John 1, 29, was just right before this. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist um, announces about Jesus. And says, Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want, he asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Remember three, these three words, come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying And they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. 
So possibly Andrew was one of these disciples of John the Baptist and saw the, heard the declaration of Jesus, began following Jesus. Andrew went with his brother. So John, Andrew's following Jesus now. Andrew went to find his brother Simon, told him, we found the Messiah. Then Andrew brought Simon to Peter. Now think of that for a moment. Here is Andrew, and Andrew is seldom mentioned through Scripture. Matter of fact, maybe the least of any of the disciples. I mean, we, we don't have any like really historic, there's not a book named after him, there's not a letter that we see in Scripture. We don't see a lot of a historical, maybe a significant influence that, that Andrew had other than these mentions in Scripture, but it was Andrew that brought his brother Peter to the Lord. Now, how many would know that Peter made significant impact upon the church? Are you following me? But it took Andrew, his brother, to bring him to the Lord. He's like, I found him. I found the Messiah. Listen, I believe in, you know, the scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 16, and I, I, I kind of reference that a lot, and I don't want to get real bogged down in it, but we know in Matthew 16, when Jesus asked them, he said, you know, who do people say that I am? And they have all these different answers. And he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, you're the son, you know, Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responds, it wasn't flesh that revealed this to you, to you Peter, but my father in heaven. And, but then Jesus, he says, upon this confession, and then the, the next few words are very important. He says, I will build my church. I will build my church. And I think that's pretty significant because I think sometimes we get in this mode that more depends upon us than it does to the Lord. When really it's Jesus is the builder. I, I was, as I was thinking about this, you know, you guys know that years ago we were in Mexico and all kinds of student ministry with junior highs and high schools. But years ago, years ago, we were invited into a city here in West Texas, and, and it was a very, it's a very small town, and they had just really been rocked. The, the principal of the high school had passed away of cancer. The star of the football team um, was messing around with a gun with a friend, ended up shooting himself and, and, and killed himself. Wasn't, wasn't suicide, but was accidentally, accidentally shot himself. There were two other students that died in a car wreck. And this is all in the span of a fall, like just September to December. And this is a town, the school, K through 12, the entire school was probably maybe about 300 students. And so, you know, if you've ever been around a town like that, you know that everybody knows everybody, if not family. Anybody have been around a town like that? And so it was, and so the superintendent heard about us, called us in. I met with them, went met with the school officials on school board. And I mean, you walked into that place and you could just feel this, the, the, the depression and oppression and the weight of what they were going through. And so long story short, we, we go, we, we do the school assembly and you can tell at first, man, I mean, it was, it was, it was a tough road to hoe. It was, it was tough ground. But you can kind of see some light breaking through, some hope breaking through. We do the event that night, and 90% of the school body came forward to receive Christ. It was unreal. It was, I mean, it was, it was truly like a revival moment. God did an amazing thing. And I'm gonna, that night, it, of all the outreaches we did, like we had a difficult time shutting down and trying to close up that night, I mean, it was like, I mean, it was a heavenly party. I mean, the depression lifted, the darkness lifted, it was awesome. But there was a young man there, and, and I got to have a conversation with him. And this young, and this kind of blows our mind about America. This young man had zero exposure to church. We're talking small town, West Texas. He had no one in his family that he knew connected to church. He had never been to a church, had never had a, a, a conversation that centered on Jesus with anybody. He had no religious lingo, no religious background, no biblical knowledge. And so he was one of the ones that responded. I, no zero, I mean zero religious affiliation. And so we're having this conversation. He says, I, I heard these words in my heart. 
something told me, I want you to be an evangelist. And I looked at him and I said, you've never been to church? He said, no. I said, your parents go to church? No. I said, do your grandparents go to church? He said, no. I said, you know anything about the Bible? He said, no. I said, what did you hear again? He said, I heard these words in my heart. I want you to be an evangelist. I said, son, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's a divine appointment of God speaking something to your heart. Listen, Jesus can build his church. Jesus can build his church. But you know what? He also wants to use us to do it. We say all the time that God isn't looking for extraordinary people. He's looking for ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. Hudson Taylor said this, God isn't looking for people with great faith, but for individuals ready to follow him. The key is those that are ready to follow him. Think about this. We talk about it often, what names mean. Andrew means man. Like, you know, here's Peter, rock, you know. I mean, we've got the sons of thunder as part of the disciples. We have all these names in Scripture that have these significant meanings. Joshua, you know, is, is um, Yeshua, and uh, just important names. And here we have Andrew, simply means man. He was an ordinary disciple. Matter of fact, some theologians refer to him as a disciple of the saint of the rake and file. Now think about that for a moment. We're not talking about somebody like D.L. Moody or Billy Sunday or Billy Graham for that matter. But you know what? God is not looking for another Billy Graham. Did you know that? God's not looking for another Jensen Franklin. God is not looking for another Craig Rochelle. God is not looking for another Tommy Barnett. God is not looking... Come on. God is not looking for another Joyce Meyer. What God is looking for is you. That's who God is looking for. He's looking for the man or the woman, the saint of the rank and file. It is those that God raises up to do something significant for the kingdom. And I know, I mean, you think about it, I know the family sometimes is the most difficult to witness to. But that's the first person. Andrew went. Don't go to sleep on me. But I want to share some statistics with you. I want you to process this just for a moment, and then some more meaningful ones that are actually fill in the blanks. But and it'll be on the screen. But before we get there, I want you to listen to this. Sixty-seven percent of Americans say a, par, a personal invitation from a family member would be very effective in getting them to church. 67%. 63% of Americans say that a personal invitation from a friend would be influential to get them to church. 63% of Americans are willing to receive information about a local church from a family member. I mean, we're talking the majority of people. 50% of Americans are very um, willing to attend a church if invited by a neighbor. Think about that. But let me, let me kind of give you the other side of this. Of those that come to church, those that are invited to church, here's how it breaks down. 2%, and these are filling the blanks, 2% come to church because of an advertisement. 2% come to church, but that's like, you know, website, that's a newspaper ad, that's a billboard, you know, TV commercial. 2% come to church because of advertisement. 6% come to church by pastoral invitation. What that means is I would have to invite 100 people in the grocery store that maybe six of them come. Because most people say, oh, that's his job. 6% come to church by organized evangelism campaign. That is a mass evangelism tactic. So some of the things we've done through the years, every year we've done Rock the Pumpkin or we've gone to the park at Easter. Think about this. Because of mass evangelism events, only 6% come to church because of that. But think about this. 86% attend church because of a friend or a relative invited them. 86%. But here's another reality. Did you know 
only 2% of people in church invite unchurched people to church? So 86% will come to church if invited by a family member or friend, but yet only 2% of the people are doing it. How in the world is a church supposed to grow when the method that God has chosen is for us to be his vessels? John chapter 1, verses 38 and 30. Listen to me. We, yes, we need to speak it out. We need to share. But we need to be the living, come and see lifestyle. There needs to be something different about us, church. If, if there is not something different about us, what's going to get people's attention? Or what's going to add weight to our words? What is different about you? Do you handle things differently? Do you have a peace about you? Do you have a joy about you? I know I've shared this before, but years ago I was doing a, a, a citywide youth thing for starting at the pole in Mule Shoot, Texas. Anybody heard of Mule Shoot? Mule Shoot, Texas, about 400 students. And I give the altar call after I preach. And it, I mean, like 399 raised their hand. And I thought, I mean, I thought to myself, I thought, I'm not giving away like money <laughs> did they misunderstand me and so i asked them again i said everybody put your hands down and i mean i was like and then i got a little more like you know hell's hot heaven's real type of scenario if you want to come to faith in jesus want to confess raise your hand 399 hand i mean i did it three times y'all and i was like something is because here's other this event was called saw you at the pole rally and so I'm thinking to myself, all these students represented a church around a flagpole. And so I, I so okay, I got one more question. I said, before I ask you to respond, I want to ask, I want, I want to ask this question. How many of you in this room are surprised that someone else raised their hand and every hand in the room went up? We've got to be the come and see. I, I'm only sharing this, friend, because I believe... And what we believe. John chapter 6. You want to look there with me really quick? John chapter 6. After this, Jesus crossed over the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw the miraculous signs he had healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed on a hill and sat down the disciples around him. It was nearly the time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look at him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he was, already knew what he was going to do. Nothing takes the Lord by surprise. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, in case we had forgotten who Andrew was, spoke up, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good of that is with a huge crowd? But here's Andrew again. Lord, I, maybe this is an opportunity right here. Maybe this young boy, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what could happen. But Lord, here's, once again, we have Andrew pointing out somebody. Listen, I, I'm praying and believe. You know what I want to see happen? I don't, I, I, don't need, I don't necessarily name submitted, but I'm praying whoever the most influential, godless, heathen sinner in Odessa, I'm praying they get saved. Amen. I'm praying they get saved. You know who's going to be a great evangelist when they get saved? That guy. See, number two is this, is that it's Jesus' difference. And once again, it's Andrew that brings somebody to Jesus. It was Andrew who brought the boy with this loaves and fish. It was Andrew. Jesus took the small thing from this boy and fed the multitudes. Now the next few blanks, I'm going to make it easy for you because we're going to go really quick. All, the next three blanks of those bullet points, the answer is Jesus. We're kind of going Sunday school style. The correct answer is Jesus. If you've taught kids, you know what I'm talking about. It is Jesus that is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That is not us. It is not our power. 
But we are the ones without people being washed and cleansed from their sins. They are not going to know what eternity with Jesus or in heaven is going to be like. It is Jesus that gives life and life abundantly. We are simply the ones pointing them the way. I say it all the time that all we are is one beggar telling another where there is bread. It is Jesus that sets the captives free But God uses us to bring those people to Jesus to give them that moment of an encounter. It's Jesus. Christ alone can save the world. David Livingston said this, Christ alone can save the world, but Christ cannot save the world alone. I want to say it again. Christ landing. John Philip, who was from the Seda in Galilee, they said, Sir... We want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. If we were to put that in modern-day vernacular, that would be like um, going to get Angela. Are you following me? I mean, you, you, you've heard Angela's stories. I mean, anybody that knows her well knows that, I mean, she has a divine encounter in every grocery store. You know, when I'm thinking we're going to go to H-E-B for 30 minutes and like an hour and a half goes by, and I'm like, well, she's with somebody in the aisle somewhere, vegetable can aisle, talking to somebody. Philip, Philip knew who to go to talk to. So maybe you don't even see yourself as an Andrew. God can still use you. God can still use you. But here's the key is that we never miss the opportunity. Never miss the opportunity. Here was the opportunity that Philip went and, got and, that went and got Andrew, and then they took some people to go to meet Jesus. Take advantage of every opportunity. The Bible says in Colossians 4 or 5, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Listen, I wish I could tell you that I wish I could tell you that, you know, everybody that's going it, to, it's, it's so easy for you guys, because everybody that's ever going to get saved is going to happen because some guy behind a pulpit on a platform. But that is not at all biblically the way that God has designed it. What he has designed it is for us together to go into the world and share about the grace of God the gift of God and the salvation and reconciliation with the Father. I'm not sharing this sermon to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to browbeat or anything like that, but listen to me. There is, there's not any excuse that we have that is relevant, that is, that, that, is, that is an excuse to say, I don't share my faith. Those divine appointments, that he'll give you that divine appointment. I believe it. I remember my grandmother, I know I've shared this, but my grandmother, you know, she had uh, uh, my, my, my grandfather, you know, for retirement, they had some rental property. And so, you know, there were, it's kind of one city block there in the big metropolis of Big Lake. And so, you know, there's all these people, these renters. And so my grandmother would have them come drop off their renter. She couldn't get out much, she, you know. She got to the point where um, you know she couldn't drive. She you know, was dependent on other people for transportation, and so she, I was there more multiple times where people would come drop off their rent. And I mean, she was she was quick, man. I mean, you know, they'd be trying to. You could tell some of them knew what was going to happen too, right? Because they're trying to hand her the check and you know be like this. But they'd reach out and she would grab them by the arm and not even ask, and she would just start praying for them. I mean, she took advantage of that opportunity. I mean, it's a little bit of a captive audience, but you know what? you got to do what you got to do. You, we need to be the ones to share our faith. John Wesley said this, the founder of the Methodist movement, you have one business on earth to save souls. C.T. Sud said this, the light that shines farthest shines brightest nearest at home. We are a church that believes to share the gospel here and to share the gospel around the world. Here's one more I want to leave you with. 
The spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The near, that's the heart of God. And so as we've done so many times, as we close, I want to remind you that on their information desk is our five friend focus. And we developed this. This came out of this actually. Billy Graham, when he was very young doing his crusades, hardly anybody was going. Right? He would do these crusades and, and do all their advertisement and, and try to connect with people. And, and very few people would come. And so Billy Graham began to pray and seek the Lord. And he said, Lord, there has, give me an idea. What can we do to get churches out of their comfort zone, to get people out of their comfort zone, and to get people to these, these crusades you're leading me to do so that people can come to faith? And so the Lord gave him what was called Operation Andrew. And if you're ever part of a Franklin Graham or Billy Graham crusade and, and were involved with it, you know about this. But they would bring the churches together. And they would teach about Andrew. And they, would have, they had a list of seven names. And when they began doing that, and people in the church began to write those seven names down, the crusades overnight went from hundreds to tens of thousands. And so that's why we do the five friend focus. That's why we do it. Why? Because it, one, it, it, it brings people to our mind and our heart that I'm going to pray for so-and-so or, you know, brother or sister or neighbor. And the second thing, the important thing is what? That it took Andrew going to get Peter and saying, come, I found the Messiah. And so the second part of our five-friend focus is the what? Is we want to pray for opportunities to start a, a conversation about Jesus. And the third thing is simply is that let us be the agents to bring them, just like Philip and Andrew went and brought these seekers to come find Jesus that we partner together and not just write their name down, not just pray for them, not just have a conversation with them, but be the instruments to introduce them to the Lord. And in that moment, you, I, I say this very carefully, are absolved of responsibility. In that moment, it's up to the Lord. It's between them and God. But you may say, well, I, I know and there's people in our life that I've told them a thousand times about the Lord. You know, I think to myself often is that uh, I don't care how many times, many people in this room, that almost week after week after week you raise your hand because do you know why? You're worth it. You're absolutely worth it. You're worth it. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. Thanks for tuning in to the Odessa First Assembly podcast. If you've enjoyed today's message, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media for updates and inspirational content throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Odessa First AG. And if you're in the area, we'd love to have you join us in person for our Sunday morning services at 10.30 a.m. You can also catch our live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and Church Online. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time on the Odessa First Assembly Podcast.